Hello, good afternoon or good morning or good evening uh, to everyone watching us today. Um, we are here again Wednesday around 5 p.m. at Central European time in the headquarters of the World Health Organization uh, with Dr. Mike Ryan and Dr. Maria Van Kerkhove to answer your questions about um, COVID-19. Um, before we start and we open the floor to you, um, I would like to wish um, happy St. Patrick's Day to everyone celebrating, but especially to Dr. Mike Ryan. He's our dearest Irishman um, and Irish representative here. So happy St. Patrick's Day, um, Mike. Thank you very much indeed. And happy St. Patrick's Day to everyone out there. Now, normally, as, as far as I've learned uh, through Irish friends, this, this would be a day of big celebration, not only in Ireland, but everywhere around the world with Irish mm -hmm. people. Um, maybe we can start with giving some advice uh, to, to people who still wish to celebrate, how to celebrate it safely in this time of, of the pandemic, or to, or to remind them on how to stay safe. No, indeed, this is the, I think for Ireland, the, the second year in a row, it's unprecedented uh, to see St. Patrick's Day cancelled no more than national days uh, in every country. They're very celebrated. But in Ireland, uh, St. Patrick's Day is particularly precious and to the Irish diaspora across the, the world and those people who feel Irish and have Irish friends, we all celebrate this day. Uh, not about celebrating the country or the, the geography, but just celebrating that sense of, uh, of Ireland and, and what it represents to us all. Um, and it's going to be important to stay safe wherever you are, and whatever you're celebrating today. And it's the same old work we've been saying it for uh, so long now. Uh, avoiding crowds, keeping your physical distance, wearing your mask, washing your hands, uh, making sure you're in a well-ventilated spot. And if families are getting together, because most things are shut down in many countries, if families are coming together, um, then it really you know, has to be within the rules that have been established uh, for those gatherings and that they're different in different countries so I won't go into them in detail. So um, but there's one thing I need to do. Please. Because I got a card today to wish me a happy St. Patrick's Day. And this is the hand of uh, Farrah Doyle, three-year-old. Uh, and I got this beautiful hamper this morning from, uh, from Maria Doyle and from Farrah. Uh, through my great friend Fiona, who works here with us here at WHO. And it was lovely. I walked in this morning, there were Irish flags all over my desk, and there was a hamper, uh, and there was this beautiful card, and that's far as hand. And, uh, you know, solidarity and everything is a good word, but it was just so nice this morning to, to have that gesture from, uh, from my fellow Irish people. So I'm very happy, and please celebrate safely wherever you are. It's a wonderful day, but let's not make it a sad day for others later. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, and this, this is a great gesture and again a reminder of how we can make each other happy still uh, during these difficult times and to make someone's day by mm -hmm. sending a card or, or uh, mm -hmm. reaching out through uh, social media digital platforms and, and, and saying hi and, and uh, wishing well. Um, I, I see that the, the, some questions are already uh, coming regarding uh, the new COVID-19 virus variants and we're invite, we'll, we'll talk about it and, and control measures in, in, in today's session, but we've also seen that um, our followers have been concerned about the, the news around the AstraZeneca vaccine uh, being temporarily posed in, in some European countries. Um, and doing an ongoing investigations uh, on um, some uh, adverse events. I know that both of you are not vaccine experts, but I'm sure that our viewers would like to hear your, opi or your opinion on why countries sometimes make those precautionary measures, um, uh, giving the, the, sorry, that some countries make those pauses in vaccinations uh, as a precautionary measure. I can, I can start. Um, I, I think, first of all, our opinions. It's not about Mike and my opinions on this. It's about, you know, how we, how vaccines are developed. They're developed as safe and effective vaccines. There are many, many clinical trials that are underway um, before they are licensed, before they are used in populations. And that's really important because people have heard a lot about, you know, these vaccines are developed so fast and so rapidly, um, but safety is not skipped. Ever, you know, so all of those clinical trials are have are, are underway, and there are many vaccines that are still in clinical trials, um, but the ones that are in use have been approved because they have passed these safety, uh, safety and efficacy. 
Um, and what we do is when these uh, vaccines are rolled out, people are monitored. Um, and so we are rolling these vaccines out in so many different countries. Um, and some countries have, have, in a precautionary approach, have, have paused the use of AstraZeneca. Um, but the group of SAGE, uh, the group of WHO, and the group of the uh, many different groups have been looking at the studies, and this is a normal practice. Whenever there is a signal of something or a potential signal, um, it doesn't mean that there's an association, but they have to look and they have to do a, a proper um, study to evaluate whether or not it's associated with the use of the vaccine. Um, the use of the vaccine far outweighs the risks. We know that vaccines that are out there are safe and effective, and it is really important that individuals get vaccinated uh, when it's your turn, when you are offered, um, because vaccines play a vital role in protecting against severe disease and death, and they're really an important tool in the toolkit for um, ending this pandemic. They're not the only one that's out there. There are many other measures that are out there as well. As you hear Mike and I talk about, we're broken records on this and we will continue to be because there are a lot of things that we can do to protect ourselves. Vaccines and vaccination are an additional important tool. Um, and um, the benefits of the vaccine and the AstraZeneca vaccine outweigh the risks. But there's many studies that are underway to evaluate how these vaccines are being used in, in individuals. Thank you, Maria. I think Maria makes, makes all the important points that the systems are in place to pick up those signals and again um, it's uh, it's important that uh, the, that is the best that's been looked at and WHO's uh, advisory committee on vaccine safety is also looking at that data which is coming in from from the countries and will we'll make the the, the, the the right determination on that but it, this very often happens I think the difference in this pandemic is that all of this is happening in in very much in in the heat of the moment and in uh, with everything in the uh, in, as it should be in the public domain but it's gaining a lot of minute to minute attention and sometimes it takes a few days to just to sort out the data and see actually what is happening what the true signal is uh, and that's difficult to do when when the news reporting is hourly and that can uh, it's great to have this transparency but it also tends to create confusion in people's minds because if I hear this hour I hear one report and two hours later my friend hears another report and then it's the difference between these reports and then everyone says oh does anyone really know what's going on here and then people get very nervous. Uh, vaccination is the single most uh, effective health intervention ever devised in, 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 in healthcare delivery. Uh, vaccines have saved millions of lives uh, but vaccines are biologic products and we have to use them carefully and safely and as Maria said uh, these va these products have been proven to be safe but when you start to use vaccines at large scale uh, problems that were potentially very rare can can crop up and that's why we have this post distribution uh, enhanced surveillance and in fact we've been watching very carefully for anything that may that may go wrong um, uh, so l let's wait and let's see uh, we would uh, advise people to keep taking the vaccines. Right now, this virus has a much bigger chance of uh, doing you a lot of harm than the very, very potentially tiny risks associated with uh, with uh, with this vaccine. Also, from the AstraZeneca perspective, again, this is a vaccine that was developed in public-private partnership between the Oxford Group, between the company, and it's one of the few products that's actually out there on the market that's been developed on a no no profit basis and that this vaccine has been developed and distributed at, at a cost price. So the, there's also been a very strong <clears throat> um, uh, impetus from both the academic and the private partner to be very transparent, to carry out these studies, to put that information out quickly. So uh, I, I think it is important that we recognize that the company and the Oxford Group have been uh, very open and are trying to, to, to really do the right thing in these in, 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 in this particular situation um, and, and, and I think we need to be very careful that we don't end up overreacting and damaging the product in people's minds until we're absolutely sure that there actually is a problem and right now uh, that is not certain and let's wait for the for the data to be looked at before we make any conclusions. So can we just also put in the chat below that WHO has issued a statement on this and we can say that you know at the present time WHO considers the benefits of AstraZeneca vaccine outweigh the risks and recommends its continued use. So I think that's important to state and we can put the full link to that statement there. And I think you hear a lot of us all the time. I mean, Mike and I, I think, and, and many, we, we preface a lot of our statements with at the present time, especially when we start talking about the variants, at the present time, at the present time, because 
um, everything that we are learning about the science of this, and this is not particularly related to vaccine, but just related to everything over the last 15 months, we're constantly learning. Um, and, and these studies, all of these studies are underway and science is a process. Um, and that's good because we have the systems in place to pull this information really together quickly to do a proper assessment and to release information. Um, and this evolves over this all over time. So we, we issue guidance, we issue statements, we do it through social media. There's lots of different different ways in which we release the information. But maybe we can put that full statement in the in the chat below so people can see they can read that directly themselves. Thank you very much. And uh, we we have already tweeted about the statement, but we will be posting now on on other platforms via comments so you can. Uh, definitely read immediately what Maria has been referring to and, and Mike as well. Um, there's a lot, a lot of questions already arriving, but before we move to this, I would just like, as usual, for you to give us an epidemiological update, as we've been seeing that the number of cases are growing uh, almost in all regions. Mm -hmm. So just to see where we're at at, at, this, at this moment in comparison to previous weeks. I'll start because okay. I think you're going to get some questions on variants you okay. said as well, so she's more of an expert on that than me. The, you know, over the last number of weeks we've been talking about how the number of cases has been stabilizing or dropping, but in fact now we've dealt with a 10% increase in cases in the last week, with over, we've come back up over two, 3 million cases, new reported cases uh, per week. Um, and uh, you know that's lower than the peak in January when we went to five million, but it's it's higher than it's been in the last number of weeks. And for the past three weeks, we've seen increases. Um, and uh, it's still true that the Americas and Europe represent over eighty percent of those of those cases. But we've seen ri uh, uh, new cases uh, and, and rising cases in, in, in almost all regions. So I think it's time for us all to take stock because as vaccines are rolling out and we have that hope of vaccines give us uh, as societies and mobility increases um, and with the implications of variants, uh, I think the dangers are right now that unless we're extremely careful with our own personal behavior, extremely careful with the measures we have in place, we risk allowing the virus to, to really rear uh, uh, back up and uh, cause us um, uh, a lot. Uh, of difficulties, and uh, I've said it before, we've said it before, the last thing we want to do is to lurch back into more and more lockdowns. We've seen in certain European countries and Italy and other places have had to resort to more stringent measures. Very disappointing for people coming up to Easter, especially in a country like Italy where Easter is a, a hugely important celebration, more than St. Patrick's is in, in my country. And these disappointments that communities have, have to suffer are, I think, even more disappointing now because people, we get our hopes up but it really does come down to our, our own individual behavior and how we comply with the, the advice uh, of governments um, and others, and then how quickly we can all get vaccination out. So I would say the situation is stable. It's not rising exponentially, but I think there's enough of a signal in the data yes. that would clearly say to us that we're, the disease is turning a corner in the wrong direction, uh, and we need to get that under control. Uh, uh, and we need to do that in, in almost every region. Uh, this is a, f a phenomenon that's going to affect uh, many, many countries in the coming weeks, especially as they open up. And Maria can speak maybe later to how variants may be helping to drive that. In other words, this virus is getting slightly harder to control mm -hmm. and we're slightly less able to make the effort to control it. And you don't need a big change. If the virus becomes a little bit more transmissible and we get a little bit less uh, careful, uh, the two factors multiply each other and you end up in a very difficult situation uh, very quickly. Um, and I think that's what I'm worried about. The, the gap between the virus's transmissibility and our effort is beginning to grow again. Uh, and we're going to fall behind the virus again. We were catching up, getting on top. And we were on top. Uh, and for us to lose, it means the virus has got to get better or we've got to get worse. And at the moment, the virus may be getting slightly better of what it does, and we're getting slightly worse at what we've been doing. And um, that worries me right now. And not, it's not out of control in the sense that we've made huge progress since January, and everyone deserves huge credit for that. But we're beginning to see worrying trends in a number of countries. Can you identify what are the main drivers in transmission at the moment as 
um, in, in winter we could see that after holiday season that we could see increasing cases and now we are seeing as well I think over 100, 120 countries started vaccinating their population so are there any um, reasons identified why we can see this increase in, in transmission in cases again? Well, I think it's a combination of factors. I mean, as, as Mike has said, we're, you know, there are worrying trends that are happening right now. It's moving in the wrong direction. You know, over the last three weeks, we have seen globally an increase in transmission. In the last week, there's been a 10% increase in case incidents around the world. Um, and we've had increases in the last week in almost every region with the exception of Afro, with Africa. Um, which is which is stabilized in a sense. And there are, are a combination of factors. We know what drives transmission. Social patterns that are our social mixing, the way that we come into contact with one another drives transmission. The virus needs people to transmit between. So if we give it an opportunity and we and people have more contacts, think about how many people you come in contact with every day. Has that changed in the last week, in the last month, in the last few days? And if so, why? Um, the, these virus variants are complicating matters. Um, there are several virus variants that have been detected around the world that have increased transmissibility. There are some mutations that have been identified in these variants that allow the virus to bind, one of the reasons allows the virus to bind to the cells more easily and infect the cells more easily. Um, that's one of the hypotheses of why they're more transmissible. If you have a more transmissible virus, and you spend time together, the possibility of you infecting someone else or being infected increases. So um, you need to minimize that opportunity. And so what we saw over the December, January period is that the holiday patterns of when people and families mixed together increased the number of contacts each person had. That drove transmission exponentially in some countries. I mean, some of the epi curves, the, the curves that you see, I think everybody knows across the world what an epi curve is now. Instead of growing very, very slowly, they were like this in some countries. I mean, we've never seen epi curves like that before. But when that social mixing stopped, when people stopped mixing with others and families stopped mixing with others, and in some countries there were quite some stringent measures that were put in place, transmission dropped. Now what we're seeing is with this slight increase, and you heard us say this, either it was last week or the week before, or one of our recent press conferences, this is worrying because we now have vaccines being rolled out in a number of countries. Some are letting down their guard. And this is not to scold anybody uh, because everybody is working so hard, but we need to stay the course. We need to make sure that we adhere to the measures that are in place because it is within our control to drive down the transmission, even with these virus variants even with variants that are more transmissible. Um, and we have to continue to stress that. So in the areas where you live, follow the local guidance because transmission is so different around the world. We have seen some countries bring COVID under control um, and their societies are opening up and that's fine. But in other countries where transmission is starting to increase again, we need to make sure that we reduce our contacts, we avoid crowds, we wear our mask, we ensure physical distancing um, everywhere we are. We make sure that we have well-ventilated rooms, we open the window. It's as simple as opening the window and the doors where we are to get some fresh air coming in. Um, if you are sick, stay home. If you are a case, make sure that you are isolated and you get appropriate care. If you are a contact, stay in quarantine. You know, keep yourself uh, isolated from others. Every single one of those measures that was put in place in the past applies now. Um, and I think that's what people don't really want to hear, you know, because we, we just want this to be over. But we can continue to drive down transmission, it, and it's still within our, our control somewhat to be able to do that. So it's important um, that everyone continues to hear this and really, you know, stay the course because we are doing well um, and we don't want this virus to research. Yeah, I think we would like as well to remind our viewers, even if they, uh, they are getting vaccinated, they still need to uh, continue with uh, applying those protective measures and the full toolbox that we have. And in that regard, maybe Maria or, or Mike, you can a answer this question coming from Say Chapin. Why continue to force people that have been vaccinated to wear masks? Are there any uh, is there any science behind it to 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 explain? Um, <coughs> we don't know fully yet to what extent being vaccinated um, prevents you processing the virus and, and spreading it to somebody else. There's no question that all of the vaccines currently on the market prevent severe disease, they prevent hospitalization, they prevent death. 
we still have to get the data on to what extent they protect you from being infected or potentially processing the virus. So you could be perfectly well. Um, uh, I'll use a, maybe another example that we have real evidence for uh, with polio. We have a vaccine called IPV, which is the injectable polio vaccine. That protects you against polio and you will never become paralyzed. But it doesn't stop you actually processing the virus in your, in your gastric or gastrointestinal system. To stop that, you have to take the oral vaccine in order to do that. So sometimes a vaccine can prevent you being sick, but it doesn't prevent you actually getting the virus and then potentially passing it on to someone else. Now, we are seeing some good preliminary data that's beginning to suggest that the vaccines are working and are preventing a significant proportion of transmission, but not completely. So in that sense, that's why we're advising uh, that uh, people re re retain those measures. But we are looking uh, at what advice we can give to people, particularly vaccinated people, meeting with vaccinated people and, and other things, what specific advice we can use to, to help people become more mobile. And again, when we're talking about you know, wearing a mask and we're talking washing your hands, uh, again, if you're vaccinated and you're an older person and you're protected, then wearing a mask and washing your hands isn't exactly um, uh, earth shattering. We're asking people to just to maintain those precautions for themselves and for others and as a matter of solidarity with everyone in the community until we understand more about the extent to which vaccines will actually protect against transmission. That's right and we're looking at this uh, regularly so with all of our guidance that we have out we're looking at um, we're always updating with new evidence that comes in but in particular, there are two aspects that we're looking at our guidance on. One are the virus variants in terms of what do we know about these variants? Is there any change in the way the virus transmits besides increased transmissibility, but is there any different modes of transmission? So far, there are no differences there. Um, does it cause different disease severity? You know, we're looking at this constantly with all of the variants of interest and the variants of concern. And we're looking at all of our guidance as it relates to vaccination and in terms of individuals who have been fully vaccinated. Um, and this is important. And what we are thinking, and we're talking about this every day, in fact, um, we're having these sessions and we're discussing with our international networks around this and consolidating the evidence. This will be a rapidly evolving space. Um, and in fact, we're thinking of how can we issue guidance and updates to our guidance more frequently um, as we learn more information about this. But as Mike said, the studies are underway. The studies that have been designed to evaluate safe and effective vaccines, the end point of those studies is looking at severe disease, looking at disease and death. There are some preliminary studies that are looking at transmission and looking at infection. And we are seeing some positive signs there, but everything is preliminary. So until we know that someone who is vaccinated cannot pass the virus to somebody else, it's important that these measures are in place. And as Mike said, um, you know, people are doing this every day. And if you think about how you get up in the morning, if you leave your house, you think, do I have my hand gel? Do I have my mask? Is it a clean mask? You know, do I have the plastic bag so I could put some, you know, the, old, the, the, the dirty mask in it? Um, you think about through your day um, how you can minimize your risk. There is behavior change that we're seeing from young individuals all the way to older individuals. The big concern are people who have really been isolated for, for a really long time. And we understand the, the need to see family and to hug grandchildren and, and all of that. And, and we all feel it as well. Um, but this is a space that is evolving and it is growing. The science is growing really rapidly. So we will be updating our guidance more regularly in this, in this aspect so that we can give advice to individuals who are fully vaccinated. But right now, we need people to continue to adhere to the measures um, so that we could prevent any potential onward spread. Thank you. Thank you both. And uh, I'll now start passing all those questions about the virus variants. Um, first question that came just as we started the conversation was from Cynthia Daud saying scientists are concerned about the new variants that are surging. Um, I would like to know better about the, uh, the P1 um, variant identified in Brazil mm -hmm. and the real protection that the vaccines are able to promote against it. So that's a great question. Uh, P1 is one of the variants of concern that WHO and partners are tracking around the world. Um, and what we are looking at when we say we're tracking these, these virus variants is one, we're looking at the spread of the virus. Where is this virus with these mutations, with these uh, are detected? And we do that through genomic sequencing, which is happening around the world. And then we look at for each of these variants, um, what do we know about transmission? 
in terms of increased transmissibility? Does it spread more easily? Uh, what do we know about severity? Uh, and what do we know about any potential impact on diagnostic tests to be able to detect cases with this variant? We look at any of the medical therapeutics, the drugs that are out there. Do they still work against people who are infected with these variants? And is there any impact on the vaccines that are out there? For the P1, um, there are some preliminary studies that have been published by groups in Brazil. Um, and, this, and we're very grateful for all of the research that is ongoing in Brazil. It's very collaborative. It's working across many different disciplines. Uh, we've seen clinicians and, and mathematical modelers and epidemiologists and public health professionals come together to study these variants. And again, this is all happening in real time. We do see some indication that there's increased transmissibility with the P1 um, virus variant. Um, and we do, and there are some studies that are underway looking at severity. We don't have a complete picture yet around severity. However, when you have more transmission, that means you have more cases. And if you have more cases, you can very easily overburden a healthcare system if, if people develop disease, seek care, and need to be cared for by medical professionals. And if you have an overwhelmed system, then people may not be able to receive the care that they need because there aren't the beds, um, there isn't the time to be able to care, and you could therefore see some increased um, hospitalization and you can see increased deaths. And so our colleagues at PAHO and our colleagues in the country office are working with, with all of the different, uh, at all of the different levels within Brazil to support um, the work that's ongoing there to study this, this variant to support um, the, the, there are a bunch of epidemiologic studies that are underway, hospitalization studies that are underway, support to make sure that oxygen is received in country. Um, and so we're learning, we're learning about this. But the P1 variant, this is, um, is circulating in Brazil. It has been detected in some other countries as well. Um, do you want me to talk about any other variants or just stick to the P1? Uh, the next question actually is coming from Jacqueline Cassis. There are now many variants, each one different. What are you doing about them? So maybe now you can give us answering her question and giving us the overview of other, other variants that we are tracking and concerned about. So there's a lot that's ongoing related to virus variants. The first thing that we're trying to do is study where SARS-CoV-2 virus is. And that's about you know good molecular testing, these PCR testing, the antigen-based testing. Um, in some countries, they're even doing self-testing. We need to know where the virus is. And in looking at those viruses, we look at any changes. So it's about de detection, first and foremost. Where are there any indications that there's changes in the virus? Changes in the virus is natural. It's called uh, virus evolution. Um, and this is a natural process. And after 15 months, um, the virus is under pressure to change. It wants, to, it doesn't want, it doesn't have any personality. Um, please don't write to me and tell me that viruses are not alive. I do know this. It's just, it's, it, viruses become more fit. Um, and being becoming more fit means that they, that there's a fitness advantage that they can infect more, more individuals. So we are tracking mutations over time. And we do this through our surveillance systems that are worldwide, um, our epidemiologic surveillance, our molecular surveillance, and our genomic surveillance. And one of the things that's weak across the world is genomic sequencing. It's improved over many years, but if you look at currently the number of sequences that have been shared, I think there are more than 700,000 full genome sequences that have been shared. And this is wonderful. I mean, it's really fantastic, but they come from a handful of countries. And what we need is more sequencing to be done in more countries so that we can look at changes in the virus across many different countries. We're working with our regional off offices um, to enhance regional approaches to this and build sequencing capacities in country and, and make sure that we support the platforms that can um, hold the sequences and do more analysis with this. What, that's not enough because not only do you monitor the sequence and the changes in those sequences, you need to understand what does this mean. And so there are many studies that are underway and WHO is working with partners to collaborate research, to coordinate research um, on these different variants to determine what does it mean. I mean, if they have these mutations, what do these mutations mean? Um, some of the mutations will change the virus's ability to bind to, to the cell. Um, some of these mutations will impact the, the body's ability to develop neutralizing antibodies. So all of that is being studied across the world. So each time you have a variant, um, and the more you look, the more you will find, 
they have to be studied properly and they have to be studied thoroughly. So we are looking at through these studies any changes in transmissibility, we're looking at any changes in disease presentation and severity, and then we are looking at any potential impacts on our countermeasures, on our therapeutics, our diagnostics and our vaccines. So it's a huge global program right now to monitor and assess each of these variants. Um, and we're classifying them at the moment. So you may hear a lot about in the media, a variant identified in California or a variant identified in South Africa or a variant identified in France. And so what we're doing is we're working with our partners to classify them, to say, okay, what do we know? And we characterize them. Are these alerts that we need to, to look into? Are these variants of interest, which require more study? Or do we know that these are variants of concern, which means it triggers a system to be able to say, okay, much more work is needed to be done to look at the impacts on our available uh, vaccines, for example. So, so far the vaccines work against these variants of concerns that we are tracking, including the P1, including the B1351, which was the variant identified in South Africa, and the B117, which is the variant that was first identified in the United Kingdom. And so this is a process that's in place, but it's something that's continuously evolving and it involves many, many different partners around the world. It, it sounds interesting when you say we are tracking the virus, how it's moving, how it's transmitting, and in my head, I just have a big map with different like, like alerts that's popping exactly, up. That's exactly what it is, it, and, it's, and it's making sure that you have an organized system to track each one of them. I mean, if you look in the media today, right now we have three variants of concern that we are tracking, and when I say tracking, that means we're looking at where they are circulating globally, and it means there are many studies underway. There are 20 more variants of interest or, ver or alerts that we are following to determine how important they are. Many of these will go, will go off the radar because they won't be important from a public health pr perspective, but we have to study each one. And so it takes some time, and that's why we have this massive global architecture around doing this, because there will be a time where we will need to think about our second generation, our third generation vaccines. So we need the process in place to say, this one triggers a new vaccine composition. We, ha we have a lot of examples of this. We do this with flu every year. Twice a year we meet to determine the, the flu composition. And so we, we need to have that same type of system for SARS-CoV-2 because this is going to be with us for some time. Yeah, I think that's the key thing. We need to, as we take the heat out of the pandemic and you know end the pandemic as a, as a massive killer as it is now, we need to move towards a longer term control program to be in a position where if we need to change the vaccines, if we need to change the surveillance, we can do that in the normal way. And this becomes more like influenza where we can manage this on a month, a yearly basis. And it may be that we're going to be having to do that for, for years to come. Uh, on the variants, I said it here at the previous thing, that's the weekly epi record, it's on the web. That's got an update every single week on the variants and that has the maps of where the variants are around the world and how far they've got. It has information on the mutations and it has information on what we're tracking. And it's a very simple way for anyone out there to just look uh, and see what's happening on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. um, and it represents the synthesis uh, of a lot of work. So uh, that's on our website. And, the, uh, and also the, the weekly numbers are on there and the global maps are on there. And it's a very simple, um, fairly accessible sort of way of keeping yourself up to date without having to be glued to the TV all the time. Or Twitter. Or Twitter. Or Twitter. Thank you. Thank you both. And uh, Maria, you, you mentioned that we need more capacities uh, to do genome sequencing. So I hope that this was um, a good way to attract young people as you've been inviting um, uh, people, especially young people, to bring new ideas and new solutions. So maybe this is one sphere of science where we can attract more people to, to study and to contribute to, if not now, but in future, to, to innova innovative solutions. Um, more women. More sort of out there for more women in science and engineering fields and math because we, you know, we need more women out there to be working on these types of fields. And there are some incredible female scientists that are out there. Um, I saw something today that was, was discussing the Fauci effect, which is warranted and I think is amazing, but I do want to highlight that there are many incredible female scientists out there that are really putting epidemiology and genomic sequencing and phylogenetics and medical research and oxygen. I mean, 
just the study of oxygen, we see people saying like, I, I didn't even think about that before and how important that is. We need more creative minds and young minds in thinking through some of these solutions. Some of the solutions we're dealing with are archaic in that sense, but there's a lot of new innovation. Um, you know, we're into digital tools and artificial intelligence and WHO is keeping up with this and we're pulling all of these sources, this, this information from open sources, epidemiologic information from open sources is pulling things from multiple languages and we're really in a new era and WHO is part of that, but we need more and we need more women in science and medical and engineering fields. So girls, Sorry, this, this is some, some celebrate March as a month of women, so we, we are still promoting um, mm -hmm. uh, that, that message. Maybe could I, I just add, because sometimes we think the solution is just more data, and more data is really important. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, uh, data can overwhelm you too. We, we need better ways of analyzing that data and the analytics and linking the data. So when we get genetic data, we need to know what the clinical data is from the hospital. And we also need to know <coughs> what the data is from the lab. And we want to know what the data is from the public health service. And when you integrate those data sources and you have someone who can do the analytics and visualize that data, and some of the most incredibly innovative stuff has not been done by the epidemiologists and not been done by the scientists, but by the visualization experts, because when you look at a map or you look at an image or you look at a cartoon, we process most of our information visually. Mm -hmm. We can process millions of pieces of information at one time. When you look at a map and look for directions, you're processing huge amounts of information. But that technology of the map has been designed to allow me to process all that information. We need everybody on board with that. So people who are really good at communications, people who are good at simplifying and telling the story. So we're not talking about pure innovation and people sitting in labs and all, you know, trying to make new vaccines. We need innovation across the whole spectrum of functions. And we call them essential public health functions. And when we mean that, we don't mean the doctors and the nurses and the scientists. We mean essential public health functions. And being a communicator or knowing how to teach people about communications or knowing how to influence people's behavior in a positive way, that's just as vital as building a new vaccine. So we need to maybe broaden our idea of what we mean by science. Social science, behavioral science are just as important in epidemic response as the lab science. Not to, not to denigrate the lab science, but sometimes when we talk science, people think we're talking about, you know, People like Maria and me test tubes. tube people with white coats on. Yeah. It's not. The, the real front line of, of epidemic control is in communities. Mm. And we've seen that. Mm. Where have we failed all the time in this response? We failed to convince people uh, that it's absolutely necessary to wash your hands or wear a mask or avoid crowds or open the windows. You know, if we could get more people to do that, uh, that's as good as vaccine. Uh, so sometimes we tend to revert to technological solutions for what are essentially behavioral challenges for us all. <coughs> it's, it's easier buy the solution than change your behavior. And we have to find both. And I think uh, the ones that I, I, I think that's where I think the most innovation is needed right now is in behavioral sciences and in, 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 in gaining new knowledge about we, how I, we as communities, as families, as individuals, react and understand <coughs> epidemics and how we behave during them and how we process information and advice and how do we build trust. Everything about this pandemic is about trust. If you tell me something, I have got to trust that you're giving me the best information and that you have my best interest at heart. Now, how many people in this response have complained that they don't trust the government or they don't trust the scientists or they don't trust each other? How much have we lost through a lack of understanding of how to build trust and build community and build solidarity and build equity. Uh, and I think that's just as scientific as building new vaccines. Thank you, thank you, Mike. And um, you've, you've been uh, saying many times, we don't want to go back to old normal, but we want to build. Go back at all. <laughs> so I, I, I hope that um, this is as well motivating for, motivation for all of us to, as, as, as we want to build a better world, to look holistically in different uh, mm -hmm. sciences, uh, science disciplines, mm -hmm. and also what could we done better in this mm -hmm. response so that we can do it better mm -hmm. next time. Yeah. But as Maria said, no, I'll say it, we need more women and girls in science, but in STEM, in the, the science uh, technology, yeah, because that's where I think there's a, you know, there's a different, uh, 
uh, women bring a different way of looking at problems, sometimes a different way of, of innovating, a different, and, and I see it here, I mean, we've got, uh, we've got Maria here who's a stellar example of that, uh, someone who's leading the science of WHO on this, but there are others. I mean, in, in our uh, incident management system here, mm -hmm. for uh, the, actually the majority of the pillar leads in this response are, are women. Janet Diaz and the, leading our whole clinical effort and uh, Melinda Frost leading on our risk communications, community engagement, mm -hmm. yourself, Maria, with the overall leadership. Uh, we've got uh, Gabby Stern, she's probably looking over my shoulder now, I don't know, <laughs> leading on, on our comms and we've got, you know, so this is not a response, uh, what's really, really refreshing for me, having been around this place for a very long time in and out, uh, this is my first <coughs> big, big, huge epidemic response where the predominant professional class at the management level are women. Uh, and it's having a really positive impact on the way we're dealing with this. And if we're becoming more open and broader in our thinking and more sensitive to issues around behavior and community and family, it may be because we're becoming more balanced and more diverse in the representation that we have in our secretariat. And you know, you do much better when you reflect the community you serve, uh, because you're more able to adapt to what the community actually needs. So WHO is, 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 is an ethnically diverse and now gender diverse organization, and that makes us better. But that's not where science is right now, yeah. <coughs> globally, and we do need to keep pushing, you know? Can I, can I touch upon something you also said about building Please. back, you know, and in, 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 in wanting something better and not going back to the new normal? I mean, not going back to the way that it was. That starts now. I mean, I've done some interviews recently where people keep talking about when the pandemic is over. And this pandemic will be over. We will get to a point where we will celebrate this, right? But the, the changes that we need to see need to start now. Because every all of us are going through something horrible right now. And this is a traumatic experience for all of us. No matter where you live, um, many people have lost loved ones. They are dealing with tremendous sorrow and grief, and I don't think as a, as a global community we have actually grieved yet. I think we are still in the trauma of all of this, and there will come a time where we will need to do this. But I think we need to do the changes that we want to see now, and it's from everything that we see with our kids, and I see this with my own kids. We see this through all the way up through leadership, and we think about this public health infrastructure that you've heard Mike and I use that phrase more probably every time we have spoken, we are hearing that public health infrastructure be used in all countries right now. But the time to build that, the time to reinforce that, the time to strengthen that is now. It's not when this is over, because everyone will move on to the next challenge, the next problem, because there will be more problems. And there are so many things that the world has to deal with. This change has to happen now. We need workforce in place. We need people who are there who are community leaders who can help. The countries that have done very well during this pandemic have built this from their communities. They have community health workers that can go door to door in the millions. And in some senses, maybe not that many, but they're used strategically and they're used compassionately. Excuse me. And we have testing, you know, there's a lot of good testing around the world, but it doesn't mean you have to test everybody all the time, every single day. If you can do that, great, but it's about strategic use of your resources. So some countries that didn't have everything in place in January and February in 2020, a year ago, what they did is they activated their system. They, they knew that there was something that needed to be activated. They heard us, um, you know, raise the alarm and issue the, the global call in the, on the 30th of January last year issue the global response and activate their systems. And they didn't need um, you know, millions of people. They used what they had strategically because they knew how important that was. And I think we need to be thinking, all of us, in our daily lives as individuals, as families, as communities, but also as leaders and as governments, what should we be doing now with the trauma that we have now to build systems that could put us in a better place for the next one? There will be another one. There will be the next one. We need to be in a better position. Um, and we need to use, unfortunately, the trauma that we're in right now to make those changes. Because now is the opportunity to be able to do so. Thank you, Maria. And speaking of using a tool strategically and uh, on what science has already developed, I'm, I'm going now to, to back to a question coming from a Facebook user, user. How do you detect viruses? What kind of tests are used? I know that we had some sessions where we were explaining on different tests, but maybe 
uh, we can remind our viewers once again, how do we really detect this, this virus? How do we detect this virus or just viruses in general? This virus, wow. SARS-CoV-2. SARS-CoV-2. So when this virus was detected, it wasn't even named SARS-CoV-2 because it was a novel pathogen. And so what happens is uh, around the world, there are a lot of systems that are in place that are looking for new pathogens, you know, emerging pathogens, we call them. And many of these emerging pathogens come from animals because most these are called zoonotic viruses. It means a zoonotic means it comes, be it passes between animals and humans. So there's a lot of surveillance um, which is ongoing around the world in wildlife animal species. And we work with our partner agencies at FAO and OIE on this, looking at domestic species, um, because we want to see which viruses are circulating in the animals. And if they are, do they pass between animals and humans? And if so, why? What are the conditions in which some of these viruses pass between animals and humans? So there's a lot of work that's ongoing um, in communities that have very close relationships with some wild animals, but also I did my PhD on H5N1 in Cambodia, um, which was such a wonderful experience. And if anyone is from Cambodia is watching, I, I, I miss my time there uh, tremendously because we were studying, this was back in 2006, um, we use what is called a One Health approach. Before, I think it was called a One Health approach, which means you look at the environment, you look at animal populations, you look at human populations, and the environment in which we live, and the environments in which we work. And you look at how pathogens can, can jump between animals and humans, and we do this through surveillance activities. Um, in this pandemic, the beginning of this pandemic, um, there was a signal that was detected. There was a cluster of pneumonia of unknown etiology. And that means that there was a cluster, means there was a, s a group of individuals that were detected in a system in China, in Wuhan, um, that were clustered in space and time, um, that, were, that had pneumonia. So they were sick. Um, and from the lab tests that were done, it wasn't some of the common pathogens. It wasn't influenza. It wasn't SARS, it wasn't MERS, it wasn't, they looked for Legionella, I think they looked for adenovirus, a, a number of respiratory pathogens. And they determined that it was something new. And the way that they were able to determine that it was something new is through genetic sequencing, looking at the, the DNA the in of the virus itself, the backbone of the virus. And they do that through sequencing. And a lot is happening. There are, are surveillance programs around the world that are always on the lookout for new pathogens. Um, and so that's what continues to happen because we are constantly on the lookout for this disease X. And with the R&D blueprint for epidemics, which was established a after the 2014-2015 Ebola outbreak in West Africa, it was looking at what are the high threat pathogens that we need to have medical countermeasures for. And we look, you think of Ebola, you think of Lhasa, you think of coronaviruses. Um, and then we also included in that list disease X. What will be the next one? SARS-CoV-2 is disease X, and there will be another one. And so it's making sure that you have the systems in place. And in fact, this is why vaccines can be developed so quickly for this virus, is because vaccines had started before last year on MERS coronavirus, another coronavirus, and for SARS coronavirus. So we were able to quickly adapt the, that work once we had the sequence for SARS-CoV-2. So there's a lot of work that's underway that are looking for these new pathogens. Um, there are many that do, you know, spill over, that they have limited spread. They don't, they don't spread into global pandemics. So there's a global community that is out there, and I hope there are more people that go into this field because it's quite fascinating to understand, you know, how viruses evolve in, in animal species and why some of them jump to humans and others don't. Thank you, Marie. And then w when, when we got finally the sequence, then the new work started in developing tests. Did we develop new tests or we adjusted existing tests to fit, to identify this virus? We have uh, produced target product profiles for drugs, for vaccines, and for, therapy, uh, for diagnostics before yeah. as part of the, the Disease X uh, process. So we were well ahead with our partners outside. And remember, our partners are in the public and the private, the academic and other sector, working with, uh, with CEPI and Gavi and many others. So this is not just WHO, and I see we, I'm not saying yeah. the WHO we, I'm saying we, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, the, the global health community, yeah. And, and when we do speak that royal we, it's, it's very much that, and it's meant in, in, in letter and in spirit. Um, uh, so I think we had some of the way, but definitely getting that, those initial sequences is very important. And remember, picking out a signal 
Um, we talk about atypical pneumonia. What, what's meant by atypical pneumonia is pneumonia that's not typical, right? So it does what it says on the tin. About 20% of pneumonias, you know, people get admitted to hospital for pneumonia. There are millions and millions of cases of pneumonia in the world every year. Uh, and about 20% of them are considered to be atypical. When, if, when the sample goes to the lab, it comes back initially negative for all the, the regular pathogens. And then the laboratories have got to go to work and think, okay, we need to do more testing. And then they find out that it's <clears throat> chlamydia or it's legionella or one of these other more weirder bacteria. Or they find out that it's a, a virus that we haven't uh, detected before. But it is hard to pick out a new signal from these hundreds and uh, hundreds of thousands and millions of these cases of pneumonia. So picking that signal out from the noise is, is, is tough. And that's what we're constantly trying to do yeah. in, in, in surveillance. But with, the, with regard to <coughs> testing, you know, the simple stuff for you being unwell and getting tested, and uh, whether you've got to decide whether you've had COVID or you haven't, for me, uh, the tests break down into, uh, I have COVID, I had COVID, or I never had COVID, right? That's how the tests break down. So what we do if we want to see if you've got an active infection is we look for the virus or we look for bits of the virus. So when we look for the virus, we look for its genetic sequence. We try and actually find the, the, the viral sequences, and that's what PCR testing is. Uh, and, and that's uh, uh, the, what they call PCR um, uh, process. We also have antigen testing, which an antigen just means a protein mm -hmm that the virus has that we can test for. So we just try and find bits of the, vi of the actual virus. That's all it is. It's nothing too sophisticated. I mean, we often use these words and everyone gets confused, right? PCR means we're looking for the virus's genetic sequence. Antigen testing is, means we're looking for bits of the virus to say it's here. Um, and, uh, and those two tests, one of those two tests can tell you whether you have a, an active infection. The PCR genetic testing is a bit more sensitive. It can whereas the antigen testing can miss sometimes and tell you that, you know, doesn't find the protein and it says negative, doesn't always mean it's negative, and that's one of the issues we've had with getting high-quality antigen testing, but it is improving. And then if we wanted to test whether you've ever had it before, say you're not sick and I want to test, oh, I was sick three months ago, I wonder if I had COVID, you get a different test, and that's called serology. And all that does is tests, it doesn't test for the virus at all, but it tests is for the antibodies that you developed against the virus. So it says, ah, Mike, you have antibodies against SARS-CoV-2, so you must have had an infection uh, in the past. And depending on the type of antibodies, and you hear people talk about IgM and IgG, depending on the type of those antibodies, you can tell whether you had the infection recently or whether you had the infection a long time ago. So I think uh, sometimes people get confused with the testing and which test. Uh, I think it's relatively straightforward. So if you're sick today and you have a fever and you go to the hospital, they're going to test you with the PCR test. Uh, if you're a contact of a case and people are doing community screening, you might have a PCR test, but they may just give you an antigen test, mm -hmm. uh, a quick test, a rapid test. Um, and if someone is trying to, as we've all been bled by the Swiss authorities, uh, to check whether we've had previous infections. And that's what we're doing with the Unity studies, mm -hmm. trying to see how many people around the world have been infected. And Maria's been leading on that work with, with many others here, Isabel and many others. Um, and that's a fabulous project where we're actually trying to see all around the world in many, many different countries who exactly has been infected. And not just where, but who has been infected. So. Uh, us understand the extent of infection that may have been missed by a surveillance system or a PCR test. Because it, the PCR test, you, the, the time in which you can test positive is limited, you know, and it depends. It depends on if you had, if you were asymptomatic, if you had mild disease, or if you had severe disease. But an antibody test can actually look backwards. We actually don't know how long the antibodies last. There's some indication they can last eight, nine months, maybe even longer. Um, and so we can look back. And so some of these serology studies these that are looking for antibodies will say, okay, among this population, if I look at different age groups, if I pick a random sample of different age groups, we can test them for their antibodies, and then we can make some kind of estimates at the population level of how many people may have been infected. 
And that's really helpful for us as we think forward. We're doing a lot of discussions. Um, we, WHO, with our partners, we. I have to be careful about our we. I, mm. I mean we a lot by our partners. And you've heard me say this before. People say, Maria, how big is your team? And I think thousands. Because we are our partners. And we're very grateful for our partners. But WHO has been discussing internally as well as with partners about 2021, this year. What does this year look like? What is 2022 going to look like? And the way that we think about this is we need to understand how much of this virus has infected people so far. And serology helps us with that. And then also the, the molecular testing helps us with that. And the vaccination coming online is going to be helpful because we, we knowing how many people have received the vaccines, they have protection as well. We don't know how long that lasts as well, but still that combination of, of information helps us understand who has antibodies, who has some protection against reinfection, who has some protection against this. And that helps us think through different scenarios of, of where we're going. People want to know, when's this going to be over? Give me a date. And I, I wish we could do that. Um, but again, the, the determination of this still depends on us. So vaccines and vaccination are an incredibly powerful tool, but they do not come at the expense of the individual level measures. We will say this, we will say this over and over again. And we think about what we do in terms of prevention, in terms of control, in terms of treatment, and in terms of vaccination. And if we can prevent infections, that's key. We prevent as many infections as we possibly can because there's a number of reasons for that, obviously, because we don't want it to spread. We don't want people to, to have severe disease. We don't want people to die. We think about control. So if somebody is infected, what do I do? And how do I make sure that the virus stops with me, that I do not infect somebody else? I get the care that I need, but I don't allow the virus to pass to somebody else. We think of treatment. If somebody is sick, how do we treat them to make sure that they don't progress to severe disease? And if they have severe disease, that they don't die. And we think of vaccination. How do we protect the most vulnerable, the most at risk? And then eventually we can, we can, pop, we can vaccinate the rest of the world. But we still need to make sure that those who are most at risk are receiving vaccine in every country. That is still not happening yet. Uh, and we really need to see that happen around the world. Thank you, Maria. Or I know we are running of time, but I have two more questions regarding uh, the new variants and testing. And the first question is, are, are you concerned that uh, the existing tests uh, may not be able to uh, identify the, the new variants? So the tests currently work against the variants. These tests can detect the variants. And so we, we, there is an assessment that is made that is looking at the different tests that are out there. There are different tests, as Mike has explained. Even the PCR tests that he explained, some of them look at different parts of the virus, and so they look at different gene targets, and most of those look at at least two or three different gene targets. Um, some of those only look at one gene target. Those may not work as well, but most of the tests around the world look for multiple targets, so they still work against that. That's good news, but we're evaluating this. Even the antigen-based tests, the lateral flow tests, they work against these virus variants so that they can still they can still detect. Thank you. And again, when we were looking way back at target product profiles and when we were looking at the original assays and the stuff, we were actually encouraging people to develop multiple targets mm -hmm. because we knew virus evolution would happen and we did not want to put all our eggs in the one basket. So we're reaping the we're reaping the, the benefits of that now. Here is the last question coming uh, from our LinkedIn viewer. Could the area where variants uh, are uh, show us about, about it, why they are arising in such places at different time? Why are, they, why are the variants arising at different time? And, and where, where my understanding of this question is geographical area uh, mm -hmm. where the variant is uh, identified. Mm -hmm. Can they tell us maybe about the factors why in this particular moment, this variance is evolving. I think the thing with viruses <coughs> is the more viruses you have, just by number, and the more time that virus replicates, the more chance randomly we, we will just come up with new, new, um, new combinations. Mm -hmm. you know, if you keep dealing cards, well, you can get different combinations. If you've got 50 cards in your deck, you get a certain combination. If you've got 5 million cards in your deck, you have lots more combinations. And that's what it is. It's a game of chance. <clears throat> and if you have lots of virus in the community and the virus is getting, you know, millions of chances to, to try out its genetic code, eventually one of those random variations in the virus just happens to be more transmissible. Mm -hmm. 
And what will happen is that virus will survive a little bit better than all the other viruses. And next week, its children or its progeny will survive even better. And that's how one virus competes out another virus. It's Darwinian. It's exactly the same that goes on in the animal kingdom. A, a better adapted uh, subspecies or strain will tend to replace all of the other strains eventually. And it doesn't have to be much better. It just has to be a little better. Uh, so the more virus we leave out there circulating, the more chance it will happen. There's another thing that can drive virus evolution, and it's something we usually do, is we can put pressure on the virus. And we see this uh, in, uh, in bacteria with antimicrobial resistance. Sometimes we can use uh, antibiotics against bacteria. If we don't use it properly, what we do is we put pressure on the, on the microbe to evolve. And we don't have that so much right now. We don't have a lot of, of those pressures on the, on the virus. The main reason why the virus is developing, uh, and it's not because of the, the geographic zone. It's not about the people it's infecting. It's not about the geography. It's about the intensity of transmission. And if you, it's interesting that in areas where we've had very intense transmission in the past, we have more variants. Um, and I think also in areas where uh, I think, as Maria said, there are more variants out there. We are just beginning to understand the full uh, distribution of variants, and particularly the ones that are of concern. But I would say to people, the less virus in your community, the less chance you have of variants emerging. And that's why we want to make sure we vaccinate people. We want to make sure that people continue with the measures. And I know, again, I'm going to say it again because it's, it's worth saying. The vaccines are a, are, are a gift. They're a gift of science, uh, and, and if we can get them distributed equitably, they will save countless lives. But the vaccines by themselves, right now, given their availability, will not end this pandemic. And they and themselves will not stop the variants emerging. Mm -hmm. What will stop the variants continuing to emerge, what will shut this virus down, is us continuing. If we want to get back to normal life, if we want to get back to going to the shops and going to school, opening up society. The price for opening up society is going to be that we continue our personal behaviors, that we continue to wash our hands and wear those masks and avoid the crowded spaces, right? It's going to mean that public health authorities have to continue with surveillance and testing and quarantine of contacts um, and that we expand vaccination as rapidly and as equitably as we can. Remember, countries like New Zealand, countries like Australia, countries like Vietnam, like China, um, um, uh, South Korea, uh, many, many, many countries have controlled, contained this disease without vaccines. Uh, and we need to get back down to the numbers in which that's possible. And they've done that by combining all of these different measures and sustaining that over time. Uh, and if we add vaccines to that, then uh, it's a massive addition. But I'm, we're really concerned at the moment. We're seeing the numbers starting to jump back up. Uh, everyone is beginning to put justifiable hope in the vaccines. And I've said it again and again. The vaccines will end the tragedy of death uh, and, the, and, the, and the horrific images of the hospital ICUs full. But it will not stop the transmission. And there are still going to be people out there who are not protected because they can't be vaccinated or they won't be vaccinated. Or, more importantly, they don't have access to the vaccines because of the way we're distributing vaccines in the world, which, by the way, is terribly unjust. Um, so we have to keep up these other activities. And we don't know for how long, but uh, I think uh, we're beginning to forget. And this is the thing we all do as humans. We just want the solution. So vaccines equals the solution. Um, I'm sorry, it's not the whole story. The vaccines are a huge part of a long-term solution. And as we get second and third generation vaccines, as we get better at the monitoring, we will get total control over this virus. We will. And there is light at the end of the tunnel. But now is not the time to let up. Now is not the time to relax. It really, really isn't. Or so many of us are going to be back in lockdowns again. So many of us are going to be uh, exactly where we don't want to be. Uh, so sorry for keep these every week you know, and telling you like to keep doing maybe we'll promise things. to go maybe, away maybe we'll go away and you'll never hear from us again and maybe that's the motivation that you need there but alex can i just reiterate on the virus variants that we are seeing here so from the information that we have on the virus variants there are a number of mutations that have been identified in several of them that 
that show that it can transmit more easily. It doesn't mean that the modes of transmission have changed. It still spreads between people. Most transmission is happening when people are in close contact with one another. Your setting matters. Indoor transmission happens more often than outdoor transmission. If you have close contact for prolonged periods of time, if you're not wearing a mask, if you're not physically distanced, if you have poor ventilation, all of that makes the situation riskier. And that is true for virus variants as well. We have not seen any data to suggest that the mode has changed in terms of airborne, fomite, vertical transmission, animal, human, any of that. It still spreads the same way. We haven't seen any changes in terms of virus survivability on surfaces or anything like that. Um, so we continue to advise, we give recommendations on all modes of transmission because all modes of transmission um, can happen and we wanna make sure that we take the steps and we, and we make sure that you take the steps to reduce your risk. And I think that's really important. But as societies are opening up, and if we let down our guard, and this is what worries us, this is what Mike just said. In the last three weeks, globally, we have seen an increase in transmission. With these virus variants, transmission is going to grow even faster. And we have variants that are of concern, and we have people's fatigue, which is a massive concern. And that combination with the fact that we don't have the vaccines everywhere where we need them is really dangerous. So let's not give this virus an opportunity to spread. Let's do what we can um, every single day. Think about what you're doing and make sure that you know what your risk is every day and take steps to lower your risk. You have the tools at hand, um, follow the local guidance, keep your physical distance, wear your mask, clean your hands, practice respiratory etiquette, open your windows, avoid crowded spaces working from home. One of the benefits of this, this pandemic, I have to say, is the fact that we, as WHO, normally we do a lot of face-to-face -face meetings. Because we have now gone into the digital world, we have actually been able to expand our networks and reach many, many more countries. We have worked really hard to expand our training so that we have now training in 50 languages so that we are able to actually reach more and more people. And I think that, that um, I think that's going to be the new norm, not every single time, but we've been able to actually reach people that have um, you know, connections. There isn't internet everywhere, um, and that is also something that needs to be improved. But you know, let's, let's take this opportunity now to drive that transmission back. I wanna see next week that transmission and the week after that transmission is reducing again. We're seeing declines in deaths. We can still do that for transmission. Thank you very much, and um, I'm, I actually don't think that people want to see you two go away. <laughs> and I will end with what Karen Shea Donovan has uh, written. Uh, thank you for all you do. And she's echoing uh, your call that we need all the brains, young, old, male, female, binary, etc. There is great power in diversity and the coming together of great minds. And in this moment when we are coming together. I just want to say that we have people watching us from the UK, Peru, Nigeria, Chad, Libya, Uzbekistan, the US, Kenya, Lebanon, Sudan, Algeria, Colombia, Switzerland, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Iraq, Tajikistan, Kuwait, Argentina, Portugal, Panama, Dubai, Ireland, uh, Timor Leste, Malaysia, Morocco, South Korea, Brazil, Greece, Italy, Paraguay, and list is way longer. Um, so this is at least one uh, moment in a week where we come together to learn more from you. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Um, I wish everyone celebrating St. Patrick's Day to celebrate safely. Um, and uh, please uh, follow the advice that Ma Mike and Maria just, uh, just uh, said. We would like to see cases going down and we all have a part uh, to play in, in that. Until next week, stay safe. <laughs>